In the summer of 1968, while I was still using my original portable shortwave radio, I did find another time station. This station was pretty hard to receive. The signal was very low, and the place I was receiving it was somewhere between 12 and 16 megahertz. That part of the band on my little portable was very cramped, so I had no idea what the frequency was. It seemed to come in during the daytime, albeit with low signal strength. When I first picked up the station, it was doing this. National Bureau of Standards, WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. Next tone begins at 23 hours, 45 minutes, Greenwich Mean Time. What the? It just disappeared. Well, of course, I didn't have the presence of mind to just sit on this channel and see if it came back. I tuned around. But then eventually, a few minutes later... Standards WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. Next tone begins at 23 hours, 50 minutes, Greenwich Mean Time. This time, the tone continued for a good two minutes. But then, all of a sudden... Again, what the heck just happened? I was listening to some sort of a time station, but now one of those shortwave telemetry type noises has taken over. What the heck is going on here? Thanks to my not very sensitive radio, and this being a not very strong station, it did take me a while to figure this out. Not to mention the fact that WWV, about two minutes out of every five minute period, would just do this. Now these ticks on my weak receiver were really easy to miss, and that's why I was having so much trouble figuring this station out. It did become easier to find, however, once the Morse code would begin. WWV twice. That's the hour. That's the minute. And this... I'll explain later. National Bureau of Standards, WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. Next tone begins at 23 hours. 55 minutes, Greenwich Mean Time. So, what was the format? Well, every five minutes, right before the top of a five-minute period, there would be a voice announcement, as you just heard. And then one of two tones would start. On the minutes ending in a five, it would be this tone, 440 hertz. On the minutes ending in zero, such as... 50 minutes, Greenwich Mean Time. It would be... This tone, 600 hertz. The tone, be it 600 or 440, would run for two solid minutes with one exception. At 45 minutes 15 seconds past each hour, the transmitter would cut off, which explains some of my early confusion. The signal would return, I think, at the 49th minute, in time for the next Morse code and voice announcement. The Morse code was always beeped out in 440 hertz tones. Now the last two characters of the Morse code sequence, such as 
National Bureau of Standards, WWV. N6 there. This is a code that has to do with propagation of shortwave signals. For shortwave, everything depends on the ionosphere, which in turn depends on solar conditions. The N means normal conditions. The 6 means fair to good. 7 was good, 9 was excellent, 5 was fair, and 3 was poor. I think 1 was impossible or something. There were two other letters that could be used, U for unstable, and W for we are so screwed. No, I've, I've actually forgotten what W stood for, but it wasn't good. The best forecast I ever heard was N8, the worst was W3. Now back to the format. The tone went for two minutes, except 45 minutes past the hour, it got cut off because the transmitter went dead, and at the top of the hour, the tone went for three minutes. Now the rest of the time, here is what would happen when the third minute would begin. Yep, turns out this was not an accident. It would happen during the third minute of each five-minute period, ten times each hour. The official story about this is that it's a time code broadcasting the time and the date over and over in pulses of one kilohertz. However, to my knowledge, there are no documented instances of this signal actually being used for that purpose. I do, however, have proof here, which I'll show you, that this signal was used in one of those government programs designed to be rolled out in a so-called doomsday scenario. This is the sort of stuff the government keeps on the down low, but this did figure into one of those programs that I'll show you in a minute. In any event, after one minute of this, WWV would do this. A whole minute of ticks, and then the fifth minute would begin with a double tick, and then there'd be some more ticks, and then eventually the Morse code and voice announcement would occur. So what was that so-called time code really used for? Well, I think the time code was just a cover story because a broadcast that actually went out on NBC in March 1969 clearly documents the real use for this signal. And it does figure into a government program to save personnel in a doomsday scenario. I know this is a little dark, but this really did go out on TV in March of 69. Have you made your selection, sir? Exactly. What is it that I'm expected to select? I'm sure I was clear. The period in which you're interested. I see. This is a fascinating machine. What is it? Ah, uh, this is the Atavacron. Interesting nomenclature. And how does it work? May I... Oh, no, sir, no. I must ask you not to touch the controlling mechanism. Return and make your selection. When you have chosen, I will prepare you through the Atavacron. Thank you, Mr. Atov. Well, at least somebody found a use for the time code. And while we're on the subject of Star Trek, let's just go to the Enterprise Bridge for a second here. Does anything in this standard bridge background noise sound a little familiar to you? I mean, think shortwave. CAU Canada, Eastern Standard Time, 14 hours, 46 minutes. Now, come on, am I the only person who's noticed this? The CHU beeps are absolutely a part of the Star Trek bridge noise. And speaking of one kilohertz tones, 
This is the Morse code ID signal of station WOO in Ocean Gate, New Jersey, which, along with station WOM in Florida and KMI in California, comprised AT&T's system for the high seas telephone service. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, telephone calls made to ships far out at sea were handled by short wave stations, who would respond to calls from ships, establish the best connection possible, and then patch the ship into the telephone network. When a channel was not in use for a phone call, WOO would often play this Morse code ID. But there was something else that they used to play that was far more memorable, and I wish I had a recording of it. I can only describe it to you. First of all, WOO used to broadcast very often in a mode of operation called double sideband. In double sideband, the same signal is transmitted as in normal AM amplitude modulation radio, but the carrier is suppressed so that only the modulation goes out on the air. When you tune in a double sideband signal on an AM radio, it has a distinctive kind of distorted sound, but you can still understand what's being said. Well, WOO used to have a recording that they would play, which was fluttery in the extreme. This is a telephone company recording. I'm sorry, but the number you have reached is not in service. Please be sure you are calling the correct number. Thank you. Worse. Much worse. Not only was it more fluttery than that, but it was being broadcast in double sideband. And the combination of the flutter and the double sideband made it sound absolutely horrific. Basically, it went like this. This is a transmission for circuit adjustment purposes from the station of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. This station is located near New York City. Except it was a female voice, and it sounded, well, you, you never forget these things. One could easily have nightmares about it. Well, I don't have recordings of that, but I do have recordings of other high seas radio type stations from all around the world playing their recordings, and here are some of them.
you may have noticed that part of the signal there was a kind of staticky sound that definitely resembled the cadence of speech. It's as if some other speech signal was either there on the recording or maybe something else on that channel. I really cannot tell you what that was. I have no idea, but I just couldn't help but notice that it had the quality of speech while sounding like a bunch of white noise. This is Genoa Radio. India Charlie Bravo. Maritime Radio Telephone Service. Test transmission for receiver tuning. Qui Genoa Radio. India Charlie Bravo, Servizio Radio Telefonico Marittimo, trasmissione effettuata per la sintonia dei ricevitori di bordo. This is Genoa Radio, India Charlie Bravo. avec les navires en mer. Cette transmission est effectuée au niveau normal de parole pour permettre le réglage des récepteurs de bord. Those last five examples are from 1982. I'm using them here to make up for what I didn't record in 1968 through 70. Also, it's possible that some of those stations you've just heard had a tone type musical ID and not a recording in the 1968 through 70 period. In any case, what follows is all from 1968, 69, and 70. Here's one in Wellington, New Zealand that has both a voice and musical component. <laughs> Ubiquitous in the late 1960s, but gone by 1982, were maritime stations using electronic tones, apparently to help ships tune in to their signal. Here are some of the ones that I picked up in 1968 through 1970. Only one of these ended up being identified. Those side pipes. 
was me at age 10 implying that it's just a guy playing bagpipes and the instrument is not going to hold up. Well, wouldn't you know it, a year later... That's what happens when you don't take care of your musical instruments. What follows is the one that we celebrated the most because we heard it all the time, and the little ditty would keep changing in various ways from one day to the next. And then a day or two later it would be more like this. And then eventually it would get like this. This must be being generated by some mechanical device. But with the speed variations, you can't help but wonder if perhaps that device involves clockwork and needs to be manually wound up every few days. There were also indications that perhaps some of the electrical contacts would eventually start to get dirty, resulting in some sickly sounding tones. The best thing about following this signal from one day to the next is that the melody itself would change in certain semi-predictable ways. One morning, in 1968, I tuned in and heard what sounded almost like a new melody. The melodic possibilities for this were fixed in a particular way which I don't want to explain in this program. Here are a few more variations. <laughs> 
Okay, that's enough. This thing turned out to be in Cuba, and the way we found out was that around 19, I think, 71, they began broadcasting an actual announcement that said what the station was. For a while, they were using the announcement sometimes and the tones at other times, but then I stopped listening to shortwave radio, so I sort of lost track of it. Okay, I think I can go back to international broadcasters now. And the next interval signal is one that I never liked, but it comes from a country that I overall liked interval signal-wise, the Soviet Union. And the reason was they made it so interesting, in spite of the fact that this one I don't especially care for. You are tuned to the North American service of Radio Moscow. And so began a series of very inconvenient transmissions to the east coast of North America. The first at 5 p.m. until 5.30, and then they'd break until 6 p.m. through 6.30, then they'd break again until 7 p.m. through 7.30. I think maybe around 9 p.m. they went continuous for a few more hours, but it was pretty weird the way they expected their listeners to tune in and tune out. They also, in spite of speaking in really good American English accents, did not adjust for our daylight time, in spite of the fact that in the eastern zone, I think every state had it except, what, Indiana? But anyway, what was interesting about this wasn't so much the programming, but what happened at the end of each programming block, because that's when the Soviet transmitters would break out into a different pattern, some carrying one station, some carrying another. Here's a 5.30 p.m. example. And that brings us to the end of this broadcast. We are talking down now until 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when you can find us in the 25, 31, and 41 meter bands on 11.85, 11.73, 9.75, 9.68, 9.65, 9 9.61, 9.60, 9 and 7.31 megahertz. So until 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this is Radio Moscow wishing you all good listening. Now, what's going to happen? Well, the only way you would know is if you had made charts checking each of their frequencies to see what they do at 5.30. There are three main possibilities. Let's see which one this is. Okay, this is going to be Radio Kiev. Let's check another frequency. Okay, nothing's happening here yet, but we do hear the typical Soviet transmitter hum. All right, back to the first frequency. Now the second. That means something like, good evening from Vilnius, Lithuania. It was an interesting language to listen to while knowing nothing about it. Didn't really sound like anything else I was familiar with. I think the word for band, as in a range of frequencies, in Lithuanian is stenshu, because they were definitely giving the frequencies, and they were always talking about this stenshu and that stenshu. But 
That's the only Lithuanian word I know, and I don't even know the right translation. In any event, Radio Vilnius, to make things more fascinating and confusing, had two interval signals. Sometimes they would use one, sometimes they would use the other, sometimes they'd use both. Here's an example of their using both. And I'm sorry to say that the rather pronounced hum that you hear in this example was extremely common on transmissions from the Soviet Union. Two interval signals for the same station occurring on a channel that would be switched from one station to another every half hour made it extremely confusing, not to mention the fact that Vilnius had a third musical ID that they would often play at the top of the hour, this. The frequencies that carried Vilnius at 5.30 did so every day, and I think maybe twice a week they would actually speak English. The rest of the time it was Lithuanian at that hour. So far I've covered two of the possibilities for what would come on at 5.30 after Radio Moscow. Vilnius was the most likely one. The second most likely was Radio Kiev in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, part of the Soviet Union in those days. The third possibility was a station that was intended only for Russian speakers. Some frequencies would do this. Экспозиция, посвященная боевой дружбе советских и французских летчиков в годы Второй мировой войны. My main collaborator at these times, Brett, and I, were puzzling over this station. We didn't know what it was, we just knew that at the start of every transmission they said this word, Mayak, Mayak. We wondered what they were Mayakity yakking about. This station as well had two interval signals. The one you just heard there is the one that was played on the half hour. On the hour, you get this. For those of you who have heard of this station, and perhaps remember its interval signals from the 1980s, may I point out that what we're hearing here are the 1960s versions that were played on a real analog celeste. The 1980s versions were played on an electronic eh, substitute. <laughs> 
if you were listening carefully there, you could hear that there was an interfering station. Ironically, Radio Moscow. That was the standard Radio Moscow interval signal, unchanged since the 1960s, but suffering a kind of frequency distortion that made it sound like aliens had somehow affected it. Now, the pattern of having multiple stations sharing the same transmitters continued into the early 1980s. Here is a 1982 recording of one of the frequencies starting to carry that Myox station, obviously on the hour from the interval signal being used, and then somebody flips a switch and all of a sudden it's Radio Vilnius. <laughs> Back to the late 1960s, the Radio Moscow schedule had breaks at 6.30, 7.30, and 8.30, and during those, you would usually hear transmissions from Radio Kiev, most of the time speaking in Ukrainian, but at 7.30, if I recall correctly, they would broadcast in English, using an alternate version of their interval signal. Good evening. It's Saturday and time again. The difference between the two versions of the Kiev interval signal was so subtle that I don't know why they had alternates. The last two note chord was different. For Ukrainian, it was a minor third. For English, a fifth. I don't know why. So far, that's four radio stations sharing the same transmitters to North America, and you kind of never knew which one was next unless you studied the schedules. But on rare occasions, there was a fifth. If I recall correctly, this would happen in the 8.30 time slot once a week. That's the interval signal of Radio Yerevan in the Armenian SSR, now Armenia, of course, and those five made up the North American frequencies. This is a fairly well-known song at the time called Midnight in Moscow. And my point in playing this, of course, is that... Well, I have to admit, I couldn't have done that in the 1960s. Now, while that Myox station did appear on the North American frequencies, those did not seem to be its home. There was a whole other set of transmitters broadcasting seemingly 24 hours a day in non-stop Russian. And that's where you would hear Mayak the most. And just as with the North American frequencies, if you listened through the day, you'd find that they weren't all the same. There were certain stations that these transmitters would carry all across the board, no matter what. This was one of them. 
уважаемые земляки. Начинаем передачу Советского комитета по культурным связям с соотечественниками за рубежом. Сегодня в программе. Краткое изложение речи Леонида Ильича Брежнева. Станзия Ровина. I guess. Now, after an hour of that, some transmitters would go to Mayak, and others would come here. Radio Stanzia Atlantica, with its interval signal sounding like a seafaring song that I know from somewhere, but... I just can't place it. Those three were the ones heard most around the clock on the Russian-only frequencies, but occasionally you'd have an hour that didn't begin with an interval signal. That was from 1982, just to show you the context. Now here from 1969 or 70 is the same thing. Not an interval signal since it only plays once, but because it did that right at the hour, it caught the attention of a lot of shortwave listeners, and I actually found it posted on YouTube with the poster not knowing what it was. So I told him. It was Moscow, and I think I heard the word Izvestia in there somewhere, so maybe it was the report from that newspaper. And then there were some hours that just began with that clock, which I'm sure is well known somewhere in Moscow. Seems like this is going to go on for a long time, so I'll just start narrating here and... Shut up! Okay. For a minute there, I was thinking they were going into 24-hour time. But no, it did strike 12. Hey, you know what that means? It means that literally... Okay, that's enough. And besides, because I didn't understand what the Russian announcer said, I don't really know if that recording was made at midnight. It could have been made at noon. Now, let me just check the GMT offset. And let's find out what GMT is. Have you made your selection, sir? Yikes! Anyway, to round out my coverage of Soviet interval signals, there were two stations that were not a part of the big Soviet transmitter switcherama. One of them I'm actually surprised about. For some reason, this station seemed to have its own transmitters. 
Avenue's radio station, Peace and Progress. This is radio station, Peace and Progress. <laughs> Radio station Peace and Progress, the voice of Soviet public opinion, for some reason had its own transmitters. It did not participate in the great Russian transmitter sharing scheme. Who would have thought? I mean, I'm sure it didn't have its own opinions. In any event, one other Soviet station, which is not surprising that it had its own transmitters, was this one. This is coming all the way from the other side of the world, Tashkent, in Soviet Uzbekistan. To receive this clearly, I used the same strategy as picking up Radio Australia, nighttime bands, in the American morning. jam-packed 50 minutes this has been. Now if you want to know how it is that I got an FBI file at age 11, the Soviets are the reason. Not their communist propaganda, but their interval signals. I had to know what all these stations were. So I wrote to Radio Moscow, and they wrote back. It turns out that that Mayak station was called Mayak, which in Russian means something like lighthouse or beacon. I understand there still is a version of that station going today. Radio Stanzia Rodina was radio station Motherland. I can only imagine that that was some serious propaganda, and all the frequencies did seem to carry it whenever it was on. Radio Stanzia Atlantica, radio station Atlantica, was a service for Soviet sailors. And the set of frequencies on which those three stations typically appeared were called the Home Service. Now, of course, in these days, I was 11 years old and was enjoying all of this as a shortwave listener, having a good time watching the stations sign on and off, never knowing a word of Russian, but enjoying the interval signals. I was aware that the Soviets were under a kind of oppression at the time. And there's a difference between the Soviet Union then and the United States now with respect to the relationship between the citizens and their media. In the Soviet Union of the late 1960s, all of the people knew that their media were lying to them. And that's the difference between the Soviet Union then and the United States now with regard to the media. I'm recording this in January 2019, 
And while France shows signs of getting a clue, we still don't see a very pretty picture here. The divide-and-conquer tactic of the media seems to be working pretty well. If we polarize over a thing that isn't even the problem, we'll never get to the solution. That's it for this program. I might do some more narrated programs with the old shortwave clips. In any event, I have a number of clips from 1982 that are not narrated, which I just haven't figured out quite how to release yet.